honor for me. Thank you for this opportunity to, and to be to speak to you in this uh, Links webinar series. Um, um, what you see here is the campus of uh, uh, CNPM, uh, National Center for Research in Energy and Materials. This is a nonprofit organization. Uh, is located in Campinas, and uh, we have a contract with the Brazilian Ministry of Science and Technology to administrate uh, these four laboratories. So the first laboratory you see here is LNLS. Uh, they gave birth to this center, and uh, we started with the uh, second generation light source, UVX, we used to call it, is deactivated now, and uh, the, the major uh, single source now is Sirius that I'm going to talk about. But before that, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning also the other four laboratories. Ellen Bio uh, is a leading facility in structural and molecular biology, drug development into cancer and cardiovascular disease, and pathogenic biology as well. Ellen Nano is a, one, the most comprehensive lab in nanoscience and nanotechnology here in Brazil. And uh, it has a complete set of electron microscopes, uh, even a cryo-electron microscope is the only in the country that have been doing a research on viruses as well. And LNBR, which does research in uh, development in microbial platforms for the production of biorenewables and uh, in industrial scale, to be honest. And they use structural biology and material structures all the way to investigate the transformation, uh, sustainable transformation of uh, biomass into different chemicals. So my talk is going to be um, divided in basically five parts. I'm first going to give you a hint on the evolution of our project from 2015 to 2021. Um, I'm speaking something about the 4G sources and some of the scientific program and um, how do we provide user support and some of the R&D, the developments that we did with industries. So uh, well, what I'm going to show is mostly uh, results from other synchrotrons and commissioning results from CDUs as well. So please feel free to ask me uh, questions about these. Uh, these are very uh, new commissioning results. Um, but let me start a story uh, in more or less about uh, 2013. Uh, so uh, the project itself uh, it started in um, much earlier, but in about 2012, uh, the MAC meeting, the Machine Advisor Committee, uh, advised us to um, aim for a sub-nanometer radian synchrotron and use the, the uh, multiband acromat technology that was being pioneered by Max Ford, NUND. Um, so uh, that was a big challenge, uh, but we decided to take this challenge and follow in your footsteps and face the many engineering challenges that was, were coming ahead. So this is uh, an overview of the, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, of the, um, uh, in 2013, the, four, the, the different projects that we had. ESRF now has the EBS synchrotron. MAX4, of course, was the first uh, MBA uh, synchrotron in the world and uh, the first more fourth generation, so-called. And now I'm going to talk about Sirius, this project here in the south of Brazil. Uh, and uh, we know there are many other projects coming uh, ahead and uh, there, this is a very exciting moment for the synchrotron community. So uh, after these discussions and the project change, we started uh, basically in 2015. That's when we had the first stone and started the construction in the, yeah, it's a greenfield site as well. So you can see the evolution of the, st the structure construction. And um, in October, 2018 was more or less when we had the, the building ready for installation of the machine. That's when we started the, the, the uh, storage wing, the booster and LINAC installation. So what you see now, it's, um, it's a small video, uh, yeah, uh, that uh, shows the internal parts, our Linux, uh, uh, that, that was not built here, but uh, everything else uh, except for the Linux was built in this campus with uh, our own technology and with many partnerships with Brazilian industries. That was a key aspect of the project that we uh, developed the know-how and we transferred to the local industries so that they could build parts for this new synchrotron. So yeah, we are not, we are not tra uh, uh, traveling at the speed of light, but you can have a fast overview of the internal parts of this storage ring. Um, we um, use the NAG coating technology for vacuum parts as well as, as, as most of these new generation synchrotrons. And uh, what you see now, it's um, we have several uh, extended beam lines that go up to 150 meters. Uh, 
This is the front end. So there's a part that connects the storage ring to the external part. That's where we are going to now. But before, let me give you a timeline since uh, this installation and the first commissioning results. So back in 2019, that's when uh, we, uh, December 2019, that's when we assembled the first uh, beam line. That was a, uh, um, a microtomography, uh, first assembly of the microtomography beam line. And with 30 microamps of current, so uh, orders of magnitude less than the design project, we were able already to do the first uh, uh, tomography back, back in the end of 2019. And since then, uh, then we uh, had accumulation with nonlinear kicker. Uh, but as we were starting to have the commissioning, we are, the world was uh, halted by the COVID pandemic. And we had to move some steps down and, and reduce the, the amount of stuff in the campus just for very uh, uh, crucial things that had to be maintained. Um, as in a slow space, we, uh, we tried to uh, ramp up again some of the activities still with a very, uh, about 25, 30% of the staff only on campus, most people working remotely. And we had a challenge to actually assemble and commissioning a beam line basically uh, doing uh, with the majority of people from, you know, these online platforms. Fortunately, we didn't have hiccups like this one we had today, but uh, that, that was very challenging, in fact, because most of the, you know, challenges, discussions, and the anxieties, and, the, uh, and the, also the celebrations, they were done basically through the computer uh, uh, interfaces. Uh, it was actually quite different from what we are used to doing in commission. So by July 20, uh, uh, we um, had the first uh, commission, technical commission of the coherent diffraction imaging beamline. And since then, we've been ramping up the current uh, and uh, starting new beam comm technical commissioning of beamlines. Uh, the beginning of this year now, we had a major realignment, and now we expect to start working with 100 milliamps and start using commissioning. But before I talk about this, let me just give a, two slides about what we define as fourth generation storage ring light sources. So basically, uh, we, uh, we understand that uh, a single electron uh, is an, in, a, in an undulator, an extended source, produces radiation that uh, we can describe having a size that depends on the size of the undulator and the wavelength of radiation, and a divergence that also depends on those two quantities. So it's a basic one electron emission radiation. And uh, as soon as uh, we have an electron beam then the, that has some size and divergence, the final beam delivered to the beam line is a convolution of this size and divergence. And uh, the major challenge here, given certain wavelength, is that we can match the emittance to the desired wavelength, uh, so to extend their X-rays, for instance, in the range of 100 nanometer radians, and also to match the beta functions as a characteristic of the oscillator into the, way, uh, the length of this undulator. So when we match these two conditions, we reach what is called the fraction limited for uh, this wavelength. And then we can extract part of uh, the uh, coherent radiation from the source. Now, very uh, simplistically, uh, we can think about the generations of storage rings, right? We had the second generation here. The, the, the size, of the, the transverse size of the beam, uh, the electron beam, is what has been, uh, we talk about uh, a lot about brilliance and about uh, emittance, but effectively for the science that we're doing, what has been reduced uh, since the, uh, you know, we improved generations of storage rings is this size. So we can think of second generation of the order of one millimeter size. That was the old synchrotron we had. Uh, third generations uh, as a hundred micrometer. And as we go to the multiband technologies here headed by Max4, uh, we reach beams of the order of 10 microns. So we can think of one order of magnitude reduction of this transverse size as we move to the, the down into technologies. Now, why is this important? Uh, because first, if we want to extract coherent radiation, the amount of coherent radiation, the fraction that you get from this beam line is inversely proportional to the size. So there you go. Uh, the first important point is that if we want to use a small lambda, uh, we rather have a very small beam in the horizontal size, the direction. The vertical direction is typically very small, but this allows you to do coherent diffraction imaging, X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy, and several uh, other techniques that need coherent beams. Now, also, because the beam size is small, you can demagnify it much easier because basically it's proportionality between the small beam size and the source size. 
And this opens possibilities into nanoprobes, extreme condition environments where you have tiny environments and you have to penetrate them with a small beam and a very low divergent beam if you want to do the fraction, for instance. So these conditions is the kind of uh, the, the small beam size is what allows us essentially to do all this new science of fourth generation beams. And um, Sirius was a machine designed to cover uh, these uh, these techniques. It was implemented for high coherent fraction, but we have a slight different design from uh, uh, from Max Four, for instance. And uh, we have this separate bending magnets uh, in different benches. And one uh, characteristic that, that allows us to do is to extract also infrared radiation, UV radiation from this magnet. So this is an example that in the fourth generation synchrotron, we're still using conventional techniques. Why this is important? Because we believe science is done with this complete set of techniques all together. So it's an enterprise where we are basically looking into multiple wavelengths, multiple scales, and the inter interesting system in nature uh, are systems with uh, that you have to look into multi-model, multi-time space-time scales. So it's a machine that with uh, uh, 518 meters diameter, 3 GeV, pretty similar to Max 4. Um, the, the lattice it was a five-band acromat. Uh, we expect to reach 350 milliamp. As I said, we are still in the 70 milliamp. And uh, otherwise, the emittance is about to reach 150 picometer radian as uh, we install the undulators. Now, this is the set of beam lines that we are planning for these first two phases of installation of beam lines. Uh, and this is where I'm going to focus my talk now, uh, essentially uh, describing what are the scientific opportunities that we hope to find in this kind of new light source. And uh, I'll give you some flavors of what we've been doing. But if you need to find more details about the description of these beam lines, you can find in our website. So I basically divide this, uh, the beam lines into themes. Of course, these are beam lines with broad spectrum of, of not only radiation, but of applications. And, uh, but they essentially cover different spatial information from the resolution to the field of view. And uh, they also uh, provide the different information from structural information all the way to electronic information. So, um, for instance, these beam lines that we think dedicated to quantum materials, uh, we are installing beam lines for unresolved photoemission, resonant elastic X ray scattering, photoelectron microscopy, and extreme conditions. Uh, for the biological or, or living matter, then we have the traditional protein crystallography and SACs and, and uh, uh, circular dichroism, but also CDI, XPCS, and nano FTIR, as I mentioned. Whereas for the functional materials or heterogeneous hierarchical matter that basically joins this, this, this two scientific scopes, then we have a broad uh, range of X-ray beam lines from X-offs to diffraction to nanoprobe and uh, pair, uh, uh, pair, pair correlation function uh, uh, from diffraction. Now, but let me start with a, a bit of a um, 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 philosophical question, let's say. So um, typically when we uh, discuss what uh, synchrotrons and what accelerators do, right? Uh, there's a tendency to think that, okay, reality is made of uh, these um, uh, elementary particles, uh, and the, 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 the quarks and the leptons and the gauge bosons that, uh, they, that make them interact. Now, being virtually and nowadays and, and discussing with everyone through virtual worlds, we, uh, you know, we, we get philosophical and uh, we've been asking what, what is real? Is this fundamental particles real or are chairs and, and, and people and ideas and love, this is real and these particles are just the useful fiction that we tell ourselves. Now, uh, I like to think uh, that uh, this is, a, of course, uh, this is a, a problem for the philosophers, but nevertheless, uh, we still have, uh, you know, uh, lines to draw where when we talk about uh, viruses and cells and intentions and organs, how do we draw this line of what is fundamental and uh, what, is, uh, what is reality and what is uh, just a manifest image? Well, I like to take the, 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 the philosophical view of uh, the philosopher Daniel Dennett, that uh, things that describe patterns, they are real. Uh, they are the touchstone of reality. So if you can predict something with a model, then it's real. And because we are pattern finders, we are designed by evolution to find these patterns. 
we just need to think of higher level structures that built uh, these uh, descriptions. So essentially what I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that uh, even though in synchrotrons and, uh, and we don't necessarily look for these elementary particles, we also have to find the standard models that allows us description of nature. So let me start with uh, quasi-particles. Uh, so uh, because this is uh, the closest we, what we have to, um, to the phenomenon that we observe in elementary fields. So, but two different parameterizations, when we look at electrons in a correlated uh, material, typically describing them as single particles uh, to a very entangled uh, state of, of, of electrons is pretty hard. And in fact, it doesn't make much sense because uh, as uh, the Fermi uh, liquid theory from, described by Landau, most of these excitations that we see in condensed matter, they behave like particles. Uh, and they manifest themselves, so they, the, the, the manifestation is uh, like particles, but with different kind of characteristics from the electrons. So we can, they can either be, uh, you know, phonon particles, and they, their gas can describe thermodynamic properties of matter, or magnets, uh, and the gas of magnets describes the thermodynamic properties of a magnet, as well as a gas of particle describes thermodynamicals, uh, the gas of molecules describes the thermodynamic of gases. And, uh, and then we have different, all, many different kinds of particles that uh, build this new reality, spinons, holons, scrimions, and uh, all these quasi-particles, they are part of this reality between milli-electron volts and kiloelectron volts. Let's take, for instance, this very nice result from the literature from resonant elastic X-ray scattering, where uh, we observe from experiments the reality of particles that carry spin, but no charge or particles that charge, the excitations that carry charge, but no spin, or the ones that carry orbit, orbital moment, but neither of them. Uh, or even when we uh, look for single particle properties from on the resolve of emission, uh, that we observe particles that can be predicted from, uh, you know, uh, to maybe they exist in the, uh, in the uh, elementary fields, like uh, Majorana fermions that may be necessary to explain the mass of uh, neutrinos, but in condensed matter, they have just become real because these are the patterns we observe. And the, the surface of some topological uh, superconductors, for instance, they uh, show aspects and patterns that just behave like these elementary particles. And uh, so the idea here is that you need these patterns and you can probe these patterns through synchrotrons to describe your reality. So, and, the, and the, we don't need to wait for nature to create these fields. We can actually search for materials uh, using synchrotron techniques like extreme condition uh, techniques, like this one to observe phase diagrams where we look for overall behavior of material until we find a phase that describes a topologically non-trivial material where we can see these excitations as a reality in these materials. So, uh, this is the first case of um, quantum materials. And, uh, and this is just a very fresh result from the Emma beamline. So it's a beamline dedicated to uh, high pressure diffraction uh, and high pressure and high temperatures and very low temperatures and magnetic fields of the order of uh, 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 10, 11, uh, uh, 11, 10 Tesla and pressures of the order of uh, terapascal. We're commissioning these beam lines, but you can see already the results from the beam line that we can draw phase diagrams and phase changes from the high pressure diffraction experiments and follow up different aspects of these um, materials as we probe the phase diagram. Obviously now in the phase diagram, we're not talking about quasi-particles. We are describing the nature to a uh, order parameter or something in a higher level. Now, um, if I uh, now summarize this area, basically we have the suit of beam lines for quantum materials, unresolved of emission, like the case that I described, RICS, like the other case I described for this collective excitations, XMCD and PIM, and extreme conditions. Now, when we move to, um, uh, let's say, uh, the animate matter, uh, and uh, I describe phase transitions, and, uh, and uh, I argue that we look from a different perspective than we would look from elementary particles or even from quasi-particles. Now, uh, when we want to describe uh, the um, living matter, uh, 
it's it's not helpful to start from electrons, even from quasi particles, uh, or even from phase diagrams. Simply, we need to start from agents, from proteins uh, that have actually intentions. They have function. They have structure, and we have to understand from the structure how things put together and uh, how the dynamics brings life uh, from dissipative processes and from adaptation of these dissipative processes that matter can you know, find different configurations where it can absorb or can reflect completely uh, and can be stable in different environments. Now, the building blocks of these constructions, they have to be in a higher uh, level scale. What you see here, for instance, is a, a very nice combination of uh, uh, structural biology, microscopy, and biophysics by these very nice images from uh, Dave Goodsell, all integrated in what we believe to be a, the complex fluid of a cell. Now, we are far from understanding how life emerges, but if we want to have a chance to understand these processes and to be able to predict future of, uh, and make this transition to understand life, from, from molecules, from these building blocks, uh, then we need more than just structural biology. We need dynamics as well. So, uh, and this dynamics can be probed in different time scales. Now, protein crystallography is a well standard uh, the, uh, technique already in many synchrotrons. And uh, in fact, this was our first beam line to start operating. And uh, this beam line uh, was uh, um, commissioned and is already accepted users, especially for studies with COVID, that's where we started, and now we are accepting users in other uh, areas as well. But uh, the next stage of this beam line will be serial protein crystallography, the Manaka beam line. And uh, there's a very nice trade-off uh, of obviously free electron lasers in these time scales of femtoseconds and picoseconds, they are unbeatable. But there is a millisecond to second time scale where we can extract lots of understanding about the dynamics of conformational changes or proton uptake that build up this higher level dynamic structure of uh, living matter. And um, so this is the first result from the Manaka beam line. It was in fact uh, the uh, protein, the 3CL protein from the COVID. Uh, this is first commissioning. Very soon after that, we started having users. So as you see here, this is the first picture of users coming to the beam line already testing uh, target drugs into COVID proteins, and uh, also uh, testing different ways of doing SAD and uh, in, in, in obtaining electronic maps of different proteins into the low energy side of the spectrum. So this is brand new co commissioning results. And uh, as I said, this beam line is already available uh, for, especially for shipping samples and using the, uh, in the synchrotron. Now, as I said, just building blocks of proteins are not enough to describe to you what life is. You need to build and, and understand, you negotiate with these higher level structures and understand their interactions, their dynamic. So for that, you need boundary conditions like the cell structure and where the elements are located. And so uh, in this sense, correlative nanoprobes and uh, X-ray fluorescence imaging combined with coherent diffraction imaging they provide this higher level and organization structure where you can input into those simulations. In the future, we'll be able to join structures and put it all together through these boundary conditions. These are results done uh, of a 3D cell structure done at APS from our colleagues. And um, it's a very interesting result. This, this took, of course, uh, uh, several hours to be done. And until it becomes a user uh, uh, widespread technique for uh, understanding two-dimensional structural cells, we will need the higher coherent flux from fourth generation synchrotrons. But uh, as soon as we understand this, right, then the next step is, okay, what is the dynamics that uh, is built in into these interactions? And this also comes from coherent probes and the coherent fraction of a new synchrotrons. Um, uh, for instance, let's have a look at uh, um, how new results from the dynamics of how proteins interact. So um, in a larger time scale, uh, space and time scale of organization, um, uh, we understand from several uh, time resolved life fluorescence experiment that phase separation, for instance, where these proteins separate, explain many aspects of cell organization in the cells and their function. Uh, 
Now, several research groups have reported that this mechanism uh, con uh, condensing hundreds uh, of proteins, uh, they carry functions like transcription, like immune responses, and uh, even reproduction uh, of the SARS-CoV uh, SARS -CoV viruses. At the same time, phase separation may cause uh, disease uh, when it goes wrong uh, and form toxic to solid bodies. So understanding these dynamics is also part of the new science that will come from this fourth generation synchrotrons. And now this is a very recent result that was published a few months ago uh, that uh, uses X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy from the Petra uh, uh, synchrotron, it's a third generation source, but it can show already uh, signatures of uh, separation between kinetics and dynamics of uh, protein condensates. They can evidence even two very distinct time scales and some of the phenomena that we understand that may be necessary to you know, give the next step for, for adaptive dissipative matter. Basically understanding memory, understanding adaptation, understanding all the aspects that we believe are built in into life behavior. Now, these are results from XPCS and it's something that will be part of our scientific program as well as in other synchrotrons. So to give you a flavor of what's going on, this is our coherent diffraction imaging beamline, the beamline that Alini works and she was just here helping us. Thanks to her, we were able to start this, this discussion. And uh, this is one of the first results where they take the zeolite, a zeolite particle uh, that was obtained by coherent diffraction image, is a nanoparticle. And so this is the detector inside the tunnel of the beamline, one of the R&D developments done here in Brazil. It's a large area, 10 megapixel detector that goes into the vacuum tunnel. And uh, once uh, you know, we, uh, we have this sample isolated, the coherent diffraction patterns, they show very nice speckles all the way through, through the acquisition patterns. And, um, and we can see actually the, the visibility of these patterns is, 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 is excellent. It shows already the, the characteristics of high coherent fraction from the synchrotrons. Now, we need a very fast detector and a high dynamic uh, range detector as well. So this is one of the uh, key developments, it's a flagship development that we did based on the Medipix uh, ships from CERN. We built this 144 ship detector, area detector that goes into the Caterete beamline. This is a, a flavor of what's going on in our commissioning. Um, now, um, putting it all together, these beamlines from living matter uh, understanding, they also make a suit of beamlines that can tell us about nano FTIR, uh, with an, uh, it's basically a SNOM technique, this Caterete beamline for CDI and XPCS, and the protein crystallography and SACS beamline. Now, when we put together aspects of inorganic matter and living matter, then we come into the materials that uh, behave completely differently because it's something created by evolution. Uh, it's a functional, and uh, like uh, the soil, for instance, is the best example, is one of uh, uh, probably my favorite examples of how science is going to, you know, tackle uh, our understanding of our current environment and help us, you know, go uh, to our future without destroying the planet and destroying ourselves. Uh, quoting Frederic Albert Fallou, uh, in nature there is no subject more worth to be considered than soil. Uh, it is this domicile for humans and by itself it originates, nourishes a multitude of beings, uh, which the entire creation and our existence uh, ultimately lasts. So now when we go into this um, soil structure, for instance, then building blocks like just proteins are not enough. We have to build uh, our standard model for an even higher level structure. And our you know, uh, elementary uh, blocks should be hydroxides, uh, inorganic samples, minerals, cementing agents, phyllosilicates, bacteria and fungi, root hairs, organic dead matter, and different concentrations of, uh, um, of ions uh, distributed in the pores of uh, the, the soil. Now, this whole complex high, uh, ecosystem uh, is uh, intrinsically heterogeneous and hierarchical, and the properties come from this web of interconnections between living matter and physical chemistry of fluids in pores, granular matter. Now, to make progress, uh, and, and we also need to understand, for instance, the um, interface in between soil and the, the plants, uh, the living organisms that live in the soil. 
Now, life on, uh, on Earth is sustained by this small volume surrounding the soil uh, of roots. Uh, this biome is called rhizosphere, uh, and we have different land scales and time scales that, uh, that make this biome living and allow flow, uh, transport, and reactions, and, and everything that brings life uh, in, on Earth. Now, it probably is the most relevant biophys biophysical and biochemical uh, uh, processes that, that happen in soil. They happen here on, uh, on this rhizo 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 rhizosphere. And uh, we've been also commissioning results uh, from the different systems. This is an example of um, data from our beamline, uh, the, uh, the, the microtomography beamline. What you see here is already part of what we intend to do in the future. This is a tomography from uh, uh, a plant inside the soil where we can study how porosity, uh, structure of the roots and the hairs, how they all come together uh, to uh, distribute nutrients in between the systems. Now, um, we are planning uh, completely, I'm um, sorry that this the picture was uh, above, but we are designing um, systems that we can, uh, we can use plants in, in situ and we can study not only plants, but the soil as well using fluorescence tomography, the fraction. So these are special devices that were designed to allow us to study uh, the rhizosphere uh, on soil. It's called the rhizomicrocosm. Some examples of what we've been doing also in terms of 4D tomography. What you see here is uh, time resolved tomography where we see the flow of liquids to a porous system. And all these renderizations, it's something also that we've been uh, taking a lot of care and is providing users with tools that we can, uh, uh, you know, deal with this humongous uh, density of data. And uh, not only that, but providing ways of interacting correctly with the data. This involves not only data taking, data processing, but also the way we cognitively understand our data. So this is brand new. It's, uh, these are uh, uh, pre-computed ambient um, occlusions and uh, techniques that allow you to understand the three-dimensional data and interact better and provide new clues for new hypotheses and new experiments. Uh, this is another example of this fluid distribution that was done into the Mogno beamline. And uh, the Karnaoba beamline, which goes to the other end, is uh, the, the Nanopro beamline. I'll give you now just the a quick uh, tour inside our synchrotron where you can see this is the longest beam line we have. It's again our flagship beam line for nanoprobe. It will have two experimental stations, one dedicated to submicron and uh, in situ environments like the rhizocosm and one dedicated to uh, nanometer resolved uh, imaging. So what you see here is a complex structure of detectors all surrounding the sample stage, fluorescence, diffraction, and uh, coherent diffraction imaging. And, all in, in, and we will also have different probes like X-ray optical luminescence. And um, OK, uh, these are recent results. We just started to commission this beamline. What you see here is the sample stage, uh, one of these detectors that we developed based on many picks. And, uh, the results that just came out from the beamline, these are commissioning results. First, uh, the steps that we did echography and fluorescence from a soil sample where we can see, see with sub nanometer resolution, sub micrometer resolution, I'm sorry, uh, the distribution of different elements. Now, the idea is to, of course, uh, interleave these two results and use echography and fluorescence uh, tomography to obtain a three dimensional mapping of. Um, uh, elements in soil or other systems with nanometer resolution. So um, with that, then uh, I conclude the, the suit of beamlines uh, uh, for this uh, functional heterogeneous and hierarchical matter uh, from the, pro the, the tomography beamline that I showed to nanoprobe and the fraction PDF and XOFs beamlines that we planned. So all together, these are the suit of beamlines to cover different aspects of matter and different spatial resolutions and field of views. Uh, as I said, may, uh, the description of these beam lines and the ones that are in, in, in current installation commissioning are the ones here in, with black uh, line in, underneath. Uh, but you can get more details in, on our website of how these beam lines were, are their specs.
Now, we've been commissioning, this is current stage of our commissioning. Uh, we are doing, um, basically are getting close to the focal lengths uh, and the focal sizes that we expect for these beam lines. Um, the um, protein crystallography is a beam line that we can adjust the focus from uh, micrometer to 100 micrometer. The, the plane wave beam line is getting close to also to optimal. Some of these beam lines we're still limited by the measurement device, but uh, we are close to installing this first six and commissioning and as we commission the accelerators as well. So this is something brand new that uh, we've been doing both of these stages together. Uh, one example of R&D that we did uh, with a Dutch company, uh, Mechatronics. This is the monochromator that we've been using in many of our beam lines. It's a high stability in our monochromator. It's necessary for maintaining the beam size, the effective beam size that, that we uh, worked so hard with accelerator science to uh, reduce the levels of nanofocusing. So this is an example of accelerator that we uh, uh, will have a uh, nano radiant stability even for fast scanning. And I give you just one example of what we did recently. Uh, it was a uh, exact spectrum for, for standard samples, synchronizing the undulator with the monochromators. And we can achieve this uh, nano stability uh, uh, with uh, high energy speeds and even uh, do examples that are very textbook with fast scanning uh, of uh, fast energy scanning. Um, now, to conclude, um, we um, I'm not going to, into details, but we expect that Sirius is not going to provide only uh, data acquisition sample preparation like most synchrotrons, but we hope to extend also sample synthesis and pre-characterization tools for the users and also modeling and computing tools. So we expect to uh, open up the spectrum of what the users can do in synchrotrons. This is just an example of labs that we have uh, installed. Uh, this is available for users. This is a thin, uh, thin, thin film growth lab. And we have other labs like a feed device to cutting samples for nanoprobe and uh, high pressure and uh, many other labs that are going to be available as well as the computer infrastructure. So we have um, clusters of GPU and CPU that can, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is not uh, working, but uh, basically is a data center where the users can access the computing power during their experiments and after their experiments as well. So all the infrastructure, the software will be accessed remotely from the users after the experiments. And uh, we also like to point out that most of our development and purchases were done here with Brazilian companies uh, and international companies, but most of the purchases done in the project, they were done in the country in Brazil. That was a prerequisite for the project as well. So finally, my closing remarks is that uh, we had to adapt installation and commissioning during the pandemics, of course, but it's working quite well uh, to, to a very integrated and collaborative team. This is essential for the success of any facility. Uh, beam lining and machine commissioning are happening simultaneously. This is challenging, but it offers also great opportunities for understanding uh, the, the different aspects of synchrotron science. Uh, we're close to nominal emittance of 250 picometer radian. Um, we still need uh, to implement uh, fast orbit feedback, and uh, we expect to, by the end of this year, to be working with pop up at 100 milliamps. This is uh, still not the nominal current, but it will allow most of the experiments that we need. Uh, we have had lots of involved developments with external companies. Uh, we still need uh, many of them to be further commissioned to require like to, to be commercial products, but they will soon be available for other communities as well. Uh, we have also implemented a, a support infrastructure for different labs uh, for chemistry, thin films, extreme conditions. Uh, the FIB and the cryo uh, uh, preparation labs are just being installed. And high performance computing is already operational and, 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 and being used by users. We expect uh, the first coherent diffraction imaging results are very promising. And uh, we expect to bring user commissioning with shipped samples. We are still not allowed to bring people to the campus, but uh, we expect in the next couple of months. So stay tuned. Uh, we hope to open four beam lines uh, for regular submission of proposals. Uh, we, uh, actually not regular yet, but user commissioning. So basically uh, trying samples that are challenging and uh, also the support labs for sample preparation and the high performance computer. So uh, computing system. So we'll 
open for users, uh, for user permissioning in the next couple of months. And um, so with that, I thank you all. And uh, I wish to some time to you here in Brazil and, uh, and to uh, have you also take advantage of the, the kind of tool that will provide advances for science. Thank you very much. And, Thank you very much, Corinne. It was such a great presentation. And yeah, so we're a little bit late for uh, for today webinar series, but I think it was really worth it to it's listen totally to your it. yeah yes. to listen to your presentation until the end because it was really really interesting. So thank you very much, Harry, again. Um, so we have questions from our audience, and I will. Uh, yeah, quickly go through them uh, with you all. And uh, please, if you have more questions, uh, just write them on the comment chat. But first question. So, since the machine is based on the Max4 concept, how much collaboration exchange is there between the two facilities? So the, um, thank you for the question. Uh, the um, is, uh, I think that, uh, yes, most of the new synchrotrons are all based in this multiband band technology, uh, which was uh, spearheaded by Max for. And uh, there was uh, uh, many uh, different aspects of this collaboration. In fact, uh, uh, Ericsson, which was one of the, uh, the pioneers of this uh, technology, uh, was part of the uh, machine advisory committee that proposed uh, that CDU's should aim for a, a higher standards uh, in, into this fourth generation synchrotron. Now, we do have collaboration with, uh, in this community, it's not a, 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 large, a very large community of synchrotrons and we all exchange ideas and designs. And I think that more should come, of course, but yes. Uh, it's a diff it's slightly different aspect because it's a, the MAX-4 is a seven band acromat, Sirius is a five band acromat. Uh, based on high magnetic field dipoles, also super bands of 3.2 Tesla. So technically, they are slightly different. But of course, we, uh, we always learn a lot from the ones that come first. Yeah, so collaboration yeah. is the key. Uh, I have another question. So like different uh, synchrotron facilities, uh, does LNS uh, have um, PhD programs uh, or uh, exchange uh, programs for postdocs? that you would like to advertise to the audience. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, uh, we, uh, we don't uh, actually hold a PhD program. Uh, we typically have uh, our scientists, they can be uh, PhD advisors to uni through universities. Uh, so we are currently not connected uh, to any university. This is, a, uh, as I said, is a, a ministry facility. Uh, but we do have, for instance, agreements with uh, São Carlos University, the Uni University of Campinas, which is one of the largest in the country. And uh, through these collaborations, the, the, the students can have their PhD done in the lab. Now, we do have opportunities uh, for, uh, uh, and I think that we still have a project, an ongoing project. If you need more details, please email me. But um, uh, um, an exchange program between Brazil and Sweden that uh, allows uh, scientists and, and, and students to uh, travel from one facility to the, to the other. I know that we have, we, uh, some of our scientists, they, they, they went to, to, to several of the beam lines to acquire experience from this first uh, uh, the, uh, pioneer project. And uh, that was very important for our facility as well. And I think this, problem, this program of funding is still ongoing. Uh, I don't know, the, unfortunately, the details, but uh, obviously it's halted by the pandemic. But I think that uh, we still have uh, one or two more years uh, to, to come that will give opportunity for these exchanges. Excellent. Uh, so please, um, uh, if you're interested, have a look. Um, other questions. So thanks, Eddie, for the great presentation. Is it possible to get uh, micro uh, HRF mapping from the nanometer based samples in any of these first installed beam lines? So yeah, so, yeah. Yes, indeed. In fact, uh, the uh, Carnauba beam line that is in commissioning, they, uh, the first experimental station that was installed uh, the, the result I showed from the soil is already uh, a, a mapping uh, based on micro X-ray fluorescence. Uh, the aim here is to go to hundreds of nanometer for this station, but it's uh, 
large working distance patients. So we, we this uh, basically the nanoprobing line has two major experimental stations. One based on 100 nanometers and uh, with large uh, working distance so that we can put environments like electrochemical cells or rhizocosm or uh, batteries and uh, different uh, in situ systems. And uh, it is already available for my uh, for user commissioning. So it's one of the beam lines that we expect to have samples shipped from uh, users as soon as we open for user yeah. commissioning. But it's it's already working with uh, let's say sub micrometer, micrometer, and um, for X-ray fluorescence. Now the next uh, experimental station is the challenging one. This is a cryo nanoprobe that we aim to reach nanometer resolution, but also with the fraction and X-ray fluorescence. Okay. So, so someone in the audience wants to say that the physics institute at the University of Sao Paulo has an agreement with Uppsala University. So that's good to know. Um, yes. So another question maybe, uh, uh, great that the, uh, there is a focus on data analysis modeling. Do you have data scientists to support the analysis? Yes. Uh, that was a decision, that, thanks for the question again. Uh, that was a decision we made uh, in the early days of the project. We, we didn't have back in the project, the, the early days, 2013, when this project started. But we figured that uh, a, 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 the key aspect of a synchrotron in terms of what you can do is, um, and, and it's totally, um, let's say the major strength is 3D imaging. Uh, of course, we have several uh, uh, major strengths and synchrotron uh, facilities. But uh, in terms of resolution and imaging, uh, 3D imaging, because X-rays can penetrate matter. And, yeah. uh, but, but we understood very, very soon that the amount of data and the algorithms that had to be developed, they were key for the success of the facility. So yes, we implemented a scientific computing group back then, which now basically is, is, is one of the, the groups that uh, interfaces with the beam lines and with the user and administrates uh, the high performance computer center and also the, the the software tools so they are the ones they uh, they also work like administrator of uh, our facility so uh, as users come they will interact with the scientific computing group that develop the algorithms from data processing all the way to data handling which is something uh, we've been uh, um, dedicating a lot of effort uh, with nvidia as well providing tools for data renderization and data visualization that's great. So we're running out of time. So I think we can ask you the last question. So I apologize with uh, the audience uh, for the other missed question, but please uh, feel free to contact uh, or to reach out maybe the speaker if there's any specific more question. So last question. Um, last question, yes. So very nice results. Uh, on the plant roots, uh, but uh, what the effect of the X-rays on the plant? So, I'm sorry, so I didn't. X-rays energy was used because, In like, which... so you showed some results about uh, studies on plants with X-rays. So the question is, uh, what X-ray energy was used, and what was the effect of the X-rays on the plant? Right. If there was any kind ah, of. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Effect. Okay. Got it. Oh. Um, so the first, uh, I think the first data I showed was from a high energy tomography beam line. That's the root into the soil. Mm -hmm. And that was used with a filtered pink beam. Um, um, so uh, I think that the average energy was about 50 kV. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a beam line. Let me tell the whole story, in fact. Uh, the first beam line that we assembled was a pre-assembly of the X-ray tomography beam line. This beam line is going to work with 20, 40, and 70 kV. But when uh, when the project was uh, starting to when we were starting to get the first uh, um, accumulated re uh, 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 electron beam, then uh, we we figured that it would be important to preassemble this beam line even without optics, so that we could uh, take the first images of CUs and show that it's actually working the whole pipeline, not only the electron beam, but we could show 3D images. Yeah? So we had this beam line working for almost uh, a year until we get the optics. We had it working with a white, a filtered white beam. So wow. basically, it was a white beam from a super band of 3.2 Tesla. So the critical energy around 20 kV. But we filtered so to have the highest part, of highest energy part of the beam. Uh, I'm not sure what was the filtering that they were using, but this is this was a high energy tomography. Nevertheless, 
Yes, indeed, we, sh we observe uh, damage on the roots, and this is probably the most criti critical part on the science, is how do you believe that, especially what we want to see is roots growing into the, uh, into the soil. How do you uh, believe that this, uh, the radiation doesn't ha affect the, uh, uh, growing, uh, the soil and the growth of the root? Uh, yeah, stay tuned. Uh, I think that a new version of the beamline now with uh, monochromatic 70 kV will allow us to do that with much less damage. And, uh, but yes, this is a, the, one of the main problems of working with living matter. But that's, that's what science is about.